All right, welcome to the second part of our lecture, Introducing Psychology. Uh, and this lecture is what I like to call a brief biography lecture. In other words, we're going to talk about who are some of the important people in this unit and what their contributions are to our field of study. In today's case, we'll really just be hitting the high points for each person. In several cases, we'll talk more about these folks as we delve into the course itself. Um, and it's worth taking a moment here just to say that you should be taking notes as you listen to this and that um, Pause it if you need to, rewind if you need to, things like that, because I'm going to be going really, really fast and spending probably less than a minute a slide. So just be aware that the pacing is going to be really, really quick as we go through this. All right, so our learning target for today is very simple, that you can identify the major contributors to the history of psychology. And over the course of this lecture, we're going to talk about 13 different people in brief and what their contributions were to the field of psychology. Some of those folks will meet just this once, and others we'll run into several times as we go through the course. Keep an eye out for which ones they are that we'll meet again. Those folks have made serious contributions to the study of psychology and are much more likely to appear on the exam. Uh, this would also be a good time to note that all the folks in this lecture should end up in your flashcards or your self-generated study guide of people to know. Uh, be sure that when you do that, however, that you leave extra space for those folks who will make multiple appearances in the course, because we'll fill in more about their contributions as we go on. <clears throat> All right, so Mary White and Calkins studied under the early psychologist William James. She studied under him at Harvard, and due to the sexism of the other students, he ended up tutoring her one-on-one. -on -one. After completing all the requirements for a PhD and, and truthfully doing better than a lot of the other male candidates, or basically all of them, Harvard decided to offer her an undergraduate degree from their sister school, Radcliffe, which only offered undergraduate degrees and was a school exclusively for women. Hawkins went on to become an early and distinguished memory researcher and in 1905 became the first female president of the American Psychological Association. Um, Charles Darwin was a British naturalist. He was perhaps best known for his masterwork on the origin of species. It's not to explain the evolution of life in, on this planet as we know it. Darwin's theory is far reaching and we'll encounter it in many places throughout the course. Undoubtedly, you're familiar with some of the basic precepts of the theory from your biology class and also from popular culture. For our purposes, what we're going to focus on in this class is the role that natural selection plays in evolutionary psychology. And natural selection is the idea that those traits that allow us to continue living and to reproduce are the traits that get passed down through the generations and that those traits are specific to the environment in which we live. Natural selection as a process takes tons of time, and so it's not a quick process. While Darwin's theory is accepted by scientists, it has its critics in the cultural realm. We'll be focusing on this idea as it applies to the ongoing discussions in psychology and about the relative influences of nature and nurture and helping us to become who we are. <clears throat> I should mention here that the information for this particular slide comes from the Women's History Museum at www.womenshistory.org. Dorothea Dix was from the Boston area and after several illnesses was in encouraged to go ahead and tour Europe as part of a cure. While she was in Europe, she met with reformers interested in helping to create better conditions for the mentally ill. After returning to the United States, she toured several asylums in various states and urged politicians to reform them, ultimately pushing for an attempt to create a national asylum system. She failed at that, but did establish asylums using more humane methods in several states. She's most closely associated with her work on behalf of the mentally ill and for running the nurses' quarter in the Civil War for the Union. <clears throat> Sigmund Freud is arguably one of the best known of the historical psychologists, and we'll come across his work and his theories throughout this course. Freud is perhaps best known for his emphasis on the unconscious mind and the outsized influence that our childhood plays in who we ultimately become. In essence, he felt that people who suffered from mental illness had unresolved conflicts from childhood that were causing problems in the present day. He sought to cure these through psychoanalysis, which is to say talk therapy. Freud's theories have made their way into popular culture through references to things like Freudian slips, when you accidentally say the wrong thing, he argued that that was your unconscious mind speaking out, or through references to things like the idea of penis envy, which is um, the idea that one of the problems that women suffer from is that they envy men for having a penis and the freedoms that come with being male. Many of Freud's specific theories have been discredited, particularly those that appear to blame mothers for their children's psychological issues in diseases that are clearly biological in nature, like schizophrenia, and that relate to the role of sexual development and subsequent psychological development. But with that being said, his primary thesis that unconscious co conflicts drive our psychological behavior serves as the basis for modern psychoanalysis. So we study Freud not because his personal theories were correct 100% of the time, but because they were very influ 
influential historically and because the key underlying idea still remains very influential to this day. <clears throat> okay. And I should mention that the information for this slide comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica online and can be found at Britannica.com backslash biography backslash G dash Stanley dash Hall. So in addition to helping found the modern fields of both educational and child psychology, Hall is perhaps best known for his pioneering use of questionnaires as a method of, of psychological study. And we'll come across some more of his work as we go. William James was a Harvard professor who is perhaps best known for writing the textbook Principles of Psychology, which was published in 1890. And it's really the first comprehensive um, psychological textbook and was used for a great many years. Um, James is also known as the father of the functionalist school of thought. And this thought, school of thought is specifically related to Darwin's theory of evolution. It looks, at, looks to attempt to establish the relationship between brain functions and their evolutionary purpose. Ivan Pavlov was a Russian physiologist who focused on digestion when he noticed that dogs drooled when they were expecting to receive food. From there, he hypothesized that he could train the dogs to drool on cue, and that did just that by using food and bells. Essentially, Pavlov's assistants rang a bell before delivering the food and trained the dogs to associate the bell with the food. Because they drooled when they expected food, the dogs would drool when they heard the bell, expecting that food would be delivered to them. We'll talk more about Pavlov and his famous experiment we talk about behavioralism and classical conditioning. <clears throat> Jean Piaget was a French psychologist perhaps best known for his work on the cognitive on cognitive development. In essence, his theory holds that we go through several, we go through life as a series of stages, and that each of these stages, our brains are in a different level of development and able to handle different levels of thinking. We start out with only being able to think about those things that we can actively perceive, and that ultimately we're able to think abstractly about a wide variety of concepts. He's also known for writing one of the first IQ tests, originally designed to help determine which children would need additional support in the French school systems. Piaget never would have wanted his tests to be used in order to separate out children the way they often are today. We'll run across Piaget and his work later in the course and continue our discussion of his work then. <clears throat> Earl Rogers is perhaps best known for his contributions to humanistic psychology and specific, specifically positive psychology theories. Roger is also known for his work around client-centered therapy. In essence, this is an approach that seeks to not to fit a one-size-fits-all approach to therapy, but instead to apply a variety of techniques, the exact combination of which are centered around a person's specific needs at a given time. We'll run into Rogers again when we study therapeutic methods and also when we talk about personality. <clears throat> B.F. Skinner is perhaps most frequently associated with behavioralism and for its categorical rejection of introspection and focus instead on observable actions and behaviors. Skinner's best known experiments primarily centered around training rats and pigeons to do things like press buttons. The essence of it had to do with whether or not he could train the animals to, biologic, to perform biologically unnecessary behaviors, like pressing a button, in the hope of receiving biologically necessary things, like food. We'll learn a lot more about Skinner and his experiments when we talk about the behavioralist approach to learning. <clears throat> Margaret Foy Washburn was the first woman to be awarded a PhD in psychology after the honor had been denied to Mary White and Calkins. Washburn was also perhaps best known as the second female president of the American Psychological Association and wrote an influential work called The Animal Mind. <clears throat> John B. Watson was a famous behaviorist who is perhaps best known for his Little Albert experiment. We'll dig into the experiment itself later in the course, but the gist of it is that he taught a toddler to be afraid of animals with white fur, starting with white rats. The experiment itself taught Albert to fear white rats by pairing it with a loud noise that the boy found distressing. That fear was later generalized to all animals with white fur, including rabbits and mice. <clears throat> Wilhelm Wundt was a German psychologist who set up the first modern psychological lab that focused on experiments. He's perhaps best known for developing theories around introspection as a way to study the structure of the mind. <clears throat> so, Take a moment and reflect on this lecture. By this point, you should be familiar with around 13 people who've had a major influence on psychology and have a sense of what that influence was. You should also know which ones we'll be running into later in the course and maybe even have a sense of what we'll be studying when we meet them again. If you don't, please take some time to rewind the lecture and rewatch parts of it. As always, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today and I look forward to our next meeting.